going over the tic-tac-toe example. Um, the last time, if you remember, way last week, um, that's right, it would have been a week ago today, all right, because we didn't have class on Thursday. I was running into an issue where it was making, the computer was making a couple moves, but then it was crashing. And it was a real bonehead move on my part. Uh, I did change the code a little bit, so the code looks a little different than it did where we left it, but let me show you what the issue was. issue was this. I had a snippet of code that looked like this. Where I generated a random move. I generated a random I and J. And then I did, until it got success, make move. Well, it's pretty easy to see the problem. It, it was pretty easy for me to see the problem with that after I got home and looked at it. Well, if I generate the random I and J up here, if I try to make a move and that's not a valid move, in other words, if the square has already been selected, then it's going to sit in that loop forever. All right? So the problem was, is I needed to put this inside the loop. So that um, it tries to make a move. If it succeeds, it's done. If it doesn't succeed, it tries a different cell and then tries to make the move. If that doesn't succeed, it tries a different cell and makes a move and all that. So that cleared up pretty well. <clears throat> the error that I got was a stack overflow, all right? Stack overflow, as some of you might know, is a popular internet website that deals with that. And, and it, uh, it gets its name from a common problem. A stack is a location in memory. And every time you put, you make a function call, things get put on the stack. They get pushed on the stack. When you finish that function call, it gets popped off, all right? The problem was, is that given that I was in a loop that was going forever and was calling a functions over and over and over and over again, I reached the limit of what the stack could call. I had called too many functions without finishing, so I got a stack overflow error. So that's, that's the problem that I was getting. And turns out the fix, fortunately, was pretty simple. Now, what I'd like to do is my main work with this um, and this is actually kind of fun, is making it do better than simply randomly selecting a space. Because that wouldn't really be a very good game, all right, if it just randomly selected. You'd probably be able to beat it most, most times. On the other hand, it's no fun if you write a game that you cannot beat, right? So what I did is I, I entered in a, a difficulty level. And let me show you it in action. I think it's on this machine. If not, I'll run it. Oh, wrong one. Here we go. What I have is <clears throat> I have a little slide control. Let's make this. There we go. And there's easy and there's hard. And the further that way it is, you can't really read it, but the label says easy. The label on the other side says hard. It starts out making its moves. It make an X. I'll move it somewhere in the middle. Had a chance to win, but it didn't. So no one won that game. The way it works is this. <clears throat> I've written code to make pretty much the best move possible. I won't guarantee that it's the best move possible, but I wrote code to make smart moves. I then put that code wrapped around some randomness so that 
depending on the difficulty setting, it'll make the correct move more or less percentage of the time. So, in other words, if I have it set, if I have the difficulty set to easy all the way over there, it's going to randomly make the move each time. It's not going to consider the rules that I put in for what makes a good rule, uh, makes a good move. So, notice there, let me win. All right. So, with the difficulty set all the way on zero, X's moves are pretty much totally random with one tiny exception, and we'll talk about that. With the difficulty set all the way over to the hard side, it's always taking the best move, which means that I'm either going to win or draw. Notice there, it had a chance to win, or I had a chance to win, but it blocked me. All right, I'm, I'm going to move over there. Ooh, not good. It missed a chance to win, but you know what? It's going to end up winning anyhow. So maybe it doesn't take the optimum best move. That, that I actually, I would qualify as a bug. I'll have to look to see why that is. At any rate, I've coded in good moves and random moves. And I use the slider, the difficulty level, to give the percentages that's going to make the good move, the percentage is going to make the better move. What I did is I actually thought a little bit about playing tic-tac-toe. All right, and this isn't a class in tic-tac-toe, but it helps to sort of think this through. What, how do you play tic-tac-toe and how can you win most of the time? Well, first of all, the best square to start with is the middle square. All right, we probably all know that. So, theoretically, if you start with the middle square, um, you, you shouldn't lose. You should tie or win, all right, provided you're making all good moves. Now, you might ask yourself, uh, or, or I might ask you, or you might ask yourself, how many moves can O make in response to this? You might say it can make eight moves in response to it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In reality, it can make two moves in response to that. Why do I say that? Well, because let's say I say O makes this move. All right? Well, you might say that, well, O could have moved over here. Guess what? You turn the game around, that's the same move. All right? So from the viewpoint of the game, other than the way it looks, this move, this move, this move, and this move are all equivalent. They're all the same sort of thing. And this move, this move, this move, and this move are all equivalent because it's all just like standing on your head or turning your head around and it turns out to be the same move. So really there's less variations in move than you might think of. So if you start with the X here, O is either going to go on the side or in a corner. All right, that's the only two possible responses. So, what I want to do is I want to go in the corner on the same line as X goes. All right, so if O goes here, I want to go here. All right, or there, it doesn't matter. Effectively, they're the same move if you like flip them in a mirror or whatever. All right. So, what's O going to have to do? O's going to have to block me. In which case, what do I do? If I go here, then I can either win that way if O blocks this, or I can win that way if O blocks that. All right. Now, if O goes into a corner, I want to do the same thing. I want to go in the same line as, a, as, as O, but in a corner as well. Then it's going to have to block me here. Well, then I better block it 
and so on and so on. So really, there's two games of tic-tac-toe that, that are played. <laughs> if everyone is not making random moves, if everyone is thinking through. First move here, second move there, first move here, second move here. This should always lead to a draw. This should always lead to X winning. All right. So, I built some rules, and apparently I missed the boat a little bit on some of those rules because, again, I had a chance to win that I didn't take. Um, and I ended up drawing a game that I should have won. So, if I was really interested in it, I'd go back and, and try to debug that. Um, but, oh well, I'll let it go. And it's more fun if, they, if, if you don't win all the time, anyhow. All right. Really, X has five moves, right? There's, there's going to be a sequence of five moves. X moves the first move, the third move, the fifth move, the seventh move, and the ninth move. The first move, I've already said, I'm always going to pick the center square. All right? So I don't have to worry about coding that. That's a no-brainer. The last move, I don't have to code either, right? The ninth move. Because there's only going to be one square left. So I only have to code three moves. I only have to code the second, third, and fourth. The second move... What I'm going to do is, I am going to, as I described, either O picks here, or O picks, either O picks a side or O picks a corner. I'm going to pick the corner of the same column or row as X picks, or I mean as O picked. So, if I pick O, or if I pick X, they either make a move on the side or the corner. I'm going to put my X on the same row or column as they made their, their O. So that's my rule for move number two. All right. My rule for number three and four are straightforward. I look to see if I can win. And if I can, I make the move. Because right, that ends the game. Or I look to see if I can't win, can O win. And if O can win, then I block O. If neither I or the O can win, then I just randomly make a move. Now, I could probably do a better job coding that if I really wanted to make an expert game. But, essentially, that's what I chose to do. All right? So, five moves. First move is always the center. Second move is always on the same row or column that O made its move. The third and fourth move looks for a win. If it doesn't find a win, it looks for a block. If it doesn't find a block, it randomly picks a move. And finally, the fifth move is whatever square is left. So let's look at the code that I have to do that. Now, this code could be refactored. All right. Last time I had a function compu computer move, and that simply made the random move. Here I have an if statement. I'm keeping track of what move number it is. And if it's move number one, I'm making my move to the space 1-1, one, one, which is the middle square. S square sub 1, sub 1. So. Remember that the number starts with zero, so that's the second row, second column. I made my make move function. Oops. I think that's the code I had from before. I don't think I changed that. This was the code that I used when two people were playing, uh, you know, or two humans were playing. So I don't think I touched that. In, this, in essence, it looks to see if that square that I'm trying to move for is available or not. If it's available, it makes the move and returns true. Otherwise, it returns false. This being the very first move, it's not going to be not available. So I don't really even have to test the return value. All right. 
If it's move number two, all right, remember, I want to go in the same row or column that O has made its move and put it in one of the corners. First, and this code is the code that does it. Now, I could probably clean that code up a little bit. We'll talk about it in a second, but I probably could clean it up. But what's more interesting to me is, is this is where the difficulty comes in. I generate a random number from 0 to 99. And if that is less than the skill level, I make this the optimized move. If it's less than the skill level, then I make the random move. So let's take a detour for a second and look how I set that skill level. That skill level is an attribute in this class. And I initialize it to 50, which is right smack dab in the middle. All right. The difficulty is set by this skill bar. So I went and added to my layout in the last row a skill bar. And I meant to put a, a label that says easy on one end and difficult on the other. And again, I probably could make that look nicer if I wanted to. But I have this skill bar, or seek bar, which indicates the skill. I grab a pointer to it. Skill bar equals seek bar find view by ID. Our ID skill, something that we do all the time to point to that element in the GUI. And I set my on skill bar or on seek bar listener to this. All right. Notice what I did when you weren't looking. All right. I changed this class to not just implement on click listener, but on seek bar change listener as well. Is that legal? Well, it must be legal, right? Because I did it. All right. So. One thing to remember about interfaces, while a class can only extend one class, it can implement as many interfaces as it needs to. All right. Again, if you're making an inheritance structure for living things, you know, a bird um, would be, um, you know, birds inherit from vertebrates, for example. But a bird could implement a class for things with feathers, things that fly, things that lay eggs, things that eat seed, and so on down the line. All right. With interfaces, it's sort of a weaker is a relationship. Uh, this main activity, for the most part, is an activity, but it can serve in the role of an on-click listener. So it also is sort of an on-click listener. It's an on-click listener, but you don't think of that as, as strong a as of a relationship. So what does it mean when I implement the on-seek bar change listener? That means that I have to implement a set of functions related to a seek bar. And those functions, sure enough, are down here which on progress changed, on start tracking touch, and on stop tracking touch. I initially had my code in on progress changed. But what happened is as I slid my finger on the progress bar, on the seek bar, it would show multiple updates for it. So it doesn't show you just when you're done. It shows you, even as you're swiping across, that event is firing off many, many, many times. And that didn't seem to make sense to me. I really am only interested in coding when I stop. So if I'm sliding this control over, I don't really need any code to execute until boom. 
I pull my finger off of it. So that's why I don't have anything coded for the on progress changed or on progress or on start tracking touch. I don't care about when I start changing the value of that. And I don't care when it changes. I care when I am done tracking it. Uh, and at that point is where I want to go and uh, grab the progress. But you still have to define those functions, right? Because, again, that's what it means to implement an interface, all right? That interface has those three functions in it as abstract functions, and you have to implement them. I don't have to do anything with them, <laughs> all right? But I have to implement it. Then, if I implement it, then this class can serve the role of a non seek listener. And if I get rid of one of these, you'll notice up here it's going to be complaining about it. If I look, it'll say something like the type main activity must implement the inherited abstract method seek bar on seek bar change listener. So I don't have to do anything in it, but I have to put that in there. That's because of the way that that interface was created. And the fact, this is implementing the on seek bar change listener. And the on seek bar change listener has these three methods defined. The same way the on click listener had only that one on click event. Exactly. Um, effectively, and again, <laughs> to sort of personify this, you need to put these three classes in there to show that this class understands what it means to be an uh, on seek bar change listener. All right? To be that, you have to be able to handle these three things. All right? And so you need those classes in. If you don't have those three methods, then you're not able to fill the role of that. You're, you're missing something. So that's why we have to have that. Now, what am I doing when I stop tracking touch? Well, I'm simply grabbing the progress and storing it in my instance variable skill. The progress in this is an integer from 0 to 100. So that's why my skill level ranges from 0 to 100. All right. And just for debugging, I put this little toast in there just to pop up a message. When, so when I was writing this code, I use that uh, toast uh, uh, class to pop up a message to show what it was. Just to make sure it was it was working right. Skill equals P. And what is P? P is the seek bar's progress. In other words, if the seek bar is all the way over to that side, the progress is 100. If it's all the way over to that side, the progress is 0. If it's somewhere in between, you know, it's whatever that is. So if it's halfway through the seek bar, the, the progress will be 50. So now I have the skill. And the way I use that skill is I roll the dice, roll the 100-sided dice. And if my random number is less than the skill, I will do the optimized move. So in this case, if skill was 0, if I made it real easy, then this would never be true. All right? And therefore, it would always do the random. So that's why if I turn my skill level all the way to zero, it's going to do random. It's just going to make random moves. If I have my skill level pushed all the way over to the other side to 100, then it's always going to do my optimal move. Now, whether my optimal move is the best move or not, you know, I, I say optimal with, you know, take that with a grain of salt. It does the move that I have coded for it with me thinking that that's the optimal move. It might not be. I might have missed something. Obviously, we saw in the one case I did seem to sort of miss something. So I'd have to go back and debug that and find what it missed. At any rate, what this is doing is this is looking to see where the O placed the O. All right. It's trying to find the row and column where the O placed the O. So I'm looping through my array, and I'm looking for where 
the O player plays CO, and I grab the two subscripts for that. Then I have a little piece of code to put it in the corner of the row or column that was selected. And then I go and I make the move. If, of course, it's not greater than the skill level, the random number I generate, I make a random move. Now, here's where I'm guessing my bug is, and maybe in explaining it in class, I'll see where my mistake is. In the case of move three or four, I'm looking to see if I can either win or block. All right? So, I'm looking to see if I can win, and if I can win, I'm going to win. If I can't win, I'm at least going to try to block. Now, if I can't win or block, I'm going to make a random move. So, move number three and move number four, the code is the same. I roll my dice to see if I'm going to make the optimal move or not. And again, optimal, take that with a grain of salt, my best move that I've coded. If I'm not going to take the best move, I generate a random move. So, I, you know, if depending on my skill level, I either take the optimal move or I do the random move in both cases. Now, I might not have a chance to block or win. All right? If, for example, the tic-tac-toe board is like this, bad example. The tic-tac-toe board is that, and it's my move, it's move three, there's no place for me to block. There's no place for me to win, right? So I have to pick one of the random squares anyhow, all right? So that's what my code says. This is the optimal move. It's first going to try to win or block. If it can't win or block, it's going to make a random move. Otherwise, because of the skill level, if I make a random move, I make the random move. Do you have a question? Okay. Yes. Okay. Good, good questions. The question is, is where does this uh, random and skill level come in? First of all, remember that the function, oops, math.random returns a value from zero to 0.999999 repeating. Okay? So that's what math random does. Pretty sure it does. Let me look it up. If not, maybe that's my bug. It said between 0 and 1, but I do believe actually it's between 0 and 0 0.1111. All right. So I multiply that by 100 then. So what do I get? I get a number from 0 to 99. Pardon me? So it's not a decimal, right. Or actually, in this case, I'll get a number from 0 to 99.99, which I'm comparing up against a decimal. Now, so that's where that piece of it comes from. This is generating a number from, effectively, from 0 to 100, or 0 to 99, actually. All right? My skill level comes from this instance variable. Uh, my skill level comes from this instance variable. In skill. Which I initialize to 50, and then I tie the skill level to the progress level of the seek bar. So in other words, if I 
move the seek bar all the way over here, then my skill level's at 100. If I move it all the way here, then my skill level is zero. First launch it, it defaults to 50, right in the middle. All right? So, if we think through this, again, sometimes it's helpful to think the two extremes. So, if my skill level is at zero, all right, my skill level is at zero, this is never going to be less than zero, right? You know, it's always going to be 1 or 15 or 12. So if my skill level is at zero, it's never going to be doing the optimal move. It's always going to be doing the random move. If, however, my skill level is 100, this is always going to be true because this can only generate a number from 0 to 99.99. Or maybe it can generate a hundred, and maybe that's where my problem comes in. I'll have to, I'll have to look at that. Um, but at any rate, most of the time it's going to be true. So I'm going to be doing the optimal move. Okay? The optimal move is the true part of the if statement. Otherwise it just does a random move. And in this particular case, I'm going to try to win or block, but if I can't win or block, I am going to just make a random move. Because there are occasions where I don't have a win or a block. All right? In which case, I've got to do something, so I'm just going to do it randomly. That actually might be the bug. I'm going to have to go and look at it. Because if that random function returns, my understanding was it returns from, from 0 to just under 1. But if it actually, re if it actually has a potential to return a 1, then uh, that could be why um, it didn't do what I expected. At any rate, win or block. Win or block is going to return a Boolean, which indicates whether it got to move a, uh, make a move or not. Okay? So, this function is going to return, going to call several functions, and each of the functions that it calls is going to return a boolean that says, hey, I, made a, I found a good move. I found a move to make and I'm going to make it. If this function gets called and no one finds a move, then it's going to return a false, in which case I'm going to make a random move. So win or block is going to do a bunch of calling. It's going to call a bunch of functions. The bottom line is either it's going to return a true or a false. So. A true means somewhere down the line we made a move. A false means, hey, we looked at all our possibilities, we didn't find a good move, so just take a shot at a random move. So, how do I tell if I can win or block? Well, it's pretty easy, really, right? I'm in a position to win... I'm in a position to win if there's a row, any of these rows, or column, or diagonal that has two of me and none of my opponent. All right? So that's what determines if I'm in a position to win. It doesn't matter if it's a row or a column or a diagonal. If there's two of me and zero of my opponent, then I'm in a position to win. And I should move here, because I have a chance to win. Now the flip side of it is, if my opponent is in a row or column, that there's two of him and none of me, then I'm in a position to lose, in which case I need to block. All right. Now, I should try to win before I, I, I should look for wins before I look for blocks, right? Because if I win, I win and the game's over. 
So if I can't win, I'm going to first look for a winning move. If I can't find a winning move, then I'm going to look for a blocking move. If I can't find either of those, I'm going to do random. So my function to win or block first looks to see if x is in a position to win. So I call find win block by x. And if I didn't make a move there, then I call the function again and I look to see if O is in a position to win. All right? So this looks to see if X is in a position to win. This looks to see if O is in a position to win. Now, what I'm doing here, and again, some of this code definitely could be refactored. Like this function probably could be refactored. Because if you notice, just at a glance, you see a bunch of statements that look a lot like each other. All right? And whenever you see that, there's probably an opportunity to refactor. But effectively, what this is doing is this is looking at the first row, the second row, the third row, the first column, the second column, the third column, the first diagonal, the second diagonal. And it's looking to see if there's a situation where one player has two and the other player has none. And how is it doing that? I'm doing a little math function where I'm counting an x as, or I'm counting Whichever one I'm looking for, I'm counting that as a 1. The other one I'm looking, counting it as a negative 1. And an empty space, I'm counting as a 0. So let me explain what I mean. If this was the board, and it is x's turn, and I'm looking to see if I can win. I'm going to look at each of these rows. So I'm going to look to see, can x win? I'm going to look at each of these rows, each of these columns, and then the two diagonals. When I'm looking to see if x is going to win, I count x's as 1's, o's as negative 1's, and an empty space is a 0. So in this case, this row has a value of negative 1. All right? This row has a value of 2. 1 plus 2 plus 0 is 2. Using that logic, a 2 means that that row, I could win if I put my piece in it, if I make my move in there. Because a 2 means that there's two of me in an empty space. Because if there was two of me and one of the opponent, then this would add up to be not two, but one. One plus one plus negative one equals that. The only possibility that's going to add up to two is when there's two of my pieces and an empty space. Now when I'm looking to see if there's a block, I count x's for one, or uh, x's for, or o's for one, x's for negative one, and a, a blank for zero. So I do the same thing, except I flip it around. So that's how I distinguish between a block and, and that. So let's see the functions. Let's translate the functions here. Well, I wouldn't need to flip it around, but then I'd, I'd look for a negative 2 instead of looking. For, uh, sometimes I look for a negative 2, sometimes I look for a 2. I want to make it just look, always look for a 2. All right. So, evaluate possibility is where I get the value of each cell in a row or a column or a diagonal. All right. So, how do I get the value? Well, this argument indicates whether I'm looking for x's or o's. And this represents the cell. 
So the first time through, this gets called, this has a value of I'm looking for an x. So I look if this tag is, matches an x, I count it as a 1. Otherwise, if it's nothing, I count it as a 0. Finally, if it's the other thing, not an x or a space, that is if it's an O, I count it as a negative 1. I then add those up, and if that equals to 2, that's where I want to make my move. So I find which cell in that row, column, or diagonal is empty, and then that's where I make my move. All right. And this is exactly where my bug is. I have x, y, and x again. That should be z. <laughs> so that's why it missed the winning move. I had a chance to take that, but it didn't because I was looking at the wrong empty cell. All right. And then it tries to make a move. Well, at any point here, if I make a move, I stop looking for moves because I made my move. And this function will return that I've made my move. And this function will return that I made my move. So otherwise, if I've gone through all of them and I have not made a move, that's when I go and do the random and do the random move. Now, this isn't about, this example isn't about like how to play tic-tac-toe, all right? It is about a couple things. It's about, again, one, some of the, the lessons to, to learn here. One of them is the notion of an interface and how I took and I used this class to implement two separate interfaces. Can I do that? Of course I can do that. A class can implement as many interfaces as you want. What does it mean to implement an interface? It means that you have a method that, or, or that, that, you, that you have coded the method, all the methods that exist in the interface. All right. So we saw that before, how there's three methods in the on seek bar change listener and there's one on the on click listener. This needs to have those four methods to implement those two. All right. We did the notion of refactoring. All right. If you remember, early on in the game here, I wasn't really using arrays. I was referring to each cell. I had a separate instance variable for each cell. Well, that would have made my life so much harder when I got down to here. All right. So at a point I looked at what I was doing and I said, you know what? Um, I can write this code a lot cleaner by going in and instead of treating each cell as an individual element, I can refer to them as an array. And so I put them in an array and that helps me out throughout the application. All right. From there, I took a little piece at a time, and each time I made some sort of improvement, either an improvement in terms of improving the functionality or an improvement in terms of making the code better. All right? Again, making the code better, putting it in an array, improving the functionality, optimizing uh, this. This is a very difficult thing to test because of the randomness involved. All right? Um, I do have, I, I do know though, the way that um, the move should work, and I also know that at, how do I want to say, at 100% skill level, it should always be making the best move. So that's kind of how I tested the logic. And that's how I kind of found the bug, right? When it passed up on a chance to win, that was like a little light bulb that went off and said, hey, I probably didn't do something right. Questions over any of this? That's a good question. Uh, the activity, it, it, the question was, um, I use the activity to um, implement um, the different listeners. All right. Um, what I would say is 
if it's something that's simple and straightforward, you might as well go ahead and do it. All right. Like in this case, there's only one thing that I click here. All right. Let, let me rephrase that. That's not entirely true. I click on nine different things. I can click on nine different image views. But all of them, all of those nine clicks, I want to treat exactly the same. So in this case, my clicking, I don't need to differentiate bet between, or I, I'm not handling different clicks of different things differently. All right, each thing that I'm clicking, I'm, I'm treating the same way. So that would lead me to believe, yeah, maybe go ahead and do it. Um, likewise, my seek bar, the, the coding for it is real simple. I'm just going and setting an instance variable. So what I would typically do is, if it's something pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and there's not like a bunch of different sort of things to click on, I would do it as, as a listener. If there would be the potential of me clicking on like a button to do this, a button to do that, I probably wouldn't want to make, uh, I probably would want to make separate classes for each of those. Um, and again, some of it relates to pr uh, personal preference. I notice a lot of people love those anonymous inner classes, you know, where you, where you say equals new on click listener and then you define and all that. I think that makes the code very difficult to read. So I, I tend to avoid those. Uh, but I'm not saying that it's wrong. I mean, that's, that's more of a style or a preference uh, issue to me. That's the million dollar question, and you could do this so many different ways, it, it, it's not even funny. Um, essentially what I do is I try to do pieces at a time, I try to do, I try to make one thing work pretty well and then go and move on to the next thing. I mean, I could have done this all different sorts of ways. I did it in a way that made sense. In other words, I thought the logic, I thought the logic to have the computer play the game with other than just doing random moves, I thought that would that would take a little thought. All right? So it's one of those like well, I'm going to wait till I'm having a good day. You know, I got a good night's sleep and that's not essential. You know, so I work more on the mechanics of it first. In other words, when I click on, you know, when I click on a square, does it change it from an X to an O? All right. Um, does it um, prohibit me from clicking on the same thing? Like if someone picked it, I can't click on it again and change it from an X to an O or whatever. All right. I got that going. And then can I evaluate? Can I evaluate if it works or not? Periodically, I then stepped back and said, that code that I have, how can I improve it? It's really odd. And again, that's where, in my mind, the, the art of programming comes in. And I hesitate to use, use the word art. Maybe craft is a better word. But um, people have their own style and their own preferences for doing it. But that's sort of my preference, where and if I was going to describe that, I'd describe that very much as sort of an iterative approach where you do pieces of it, add, 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 take a step back, improve. Then get back in, add, 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 take a step back and improve. So doing this, I'm probably a couple of iterations from having this, like if I wanted to make this and put it on Amazon Market. I'm probably a couple iterations from, from that. Because what I'd want to do, first of all, is I'd want to test it more thoroughly. And I'd probably want to back up and look at my code and say, well, how can I improve it? Because I know some of that stuff isn't the optimal code. All right? Um, but then I also know that there's some features that I want to do. Um, it's tough to wait until you're done with everything to do any refactoring. Because then you have a massive program and you're refactoring a lot. That's why I prefer to sort of, again, do it in cycles. And 
I, although I hesitate to use the word, do it in a way that sort of feels right for the particular project. You know, break it down into the little pieces uh, and do that. Um, but, you know, that's a million dollar question. You know, that's something you sort of work through. And I don't know if I could, you know, were I to do this again as possible, I might have done things in a different order. Just whatever seemed to make sense for me uh, in a particular case. So that's uh, probably as close to a non-answer as you can get. But, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, again, uh, the, the the only thing I would say is, is think think small little pieces, do you know, get a little piece of it done, back up. Can I improve it? Then go on to the next piece. Is probably to, to sort of summarize the approach. Um, if you never go back and improve it, you're probably going to end up with a mess of a program. If you wait until you're all done before you think at all about refactoring, you're probably also going to end up with a mess because you're going to look and say. Oh, it's going to be a nightmare to try to, to tweak this. But yeah, but if you do it in manageable pieces, then it's like, okay, I'm going to get this done. Then I'm going to take a step back and say, this little piece of it, how can I make it better? The other thing I do a lot, and I'm not sure if I did it in this case a lot, but the whole idea of um, like stub functions. And uh, in other words, writing something little that you know you're going to change, but is going to like fit the bill for now. For example, I knew I wanted to build some sense into the computer playing side of it, but I wasn't ready to deal with that yet. So I wrote the function to generate a random move. All right, it's like okay, later on I'm going to figure out smarter moves, but right now, just so I can get the rest of it going, I'm going to just generate a random move. And, and so. There's a lot of places where you can do that, and or like with the skill level. When I was playing around with the skill level, I hard coded the skill level number. And it's like, well, let's try it when the skill level is 100, all right? And I didn't even have the slider yet to control that, but okay, when it's 100, yeah, it looks like it's making the, the optimal move each time. Let me set it to zero. So doing things like that, where you go in and you hard code or you write a function, it doesn't really do exactly what ultimately it will do, but it does enough of it so that you can like test and check things out, and then you can make it like work for real. And then the last thing I did again with the skill levels, I actually wired it to the seek bar. So as I moved the seek bar, I was really changing the skill level. No, I, I would I would say again, like uh, the the try catches again, where I would put them would be, you know, if, if I wouldn't if if I'm not putting the try catches in the first pass, I'd definitely do it in the first round of refactoring. So in other words, if I wrote some code, maybe because I'm in a hurry and I'm just seeing what's going on, and I know okay, I know this doesn't do validation like it should, but you know. I'm, I'm going to be careful. I won't put in anything that's wrong. All right, that's fine. But then, before you go on to the next stage, you do that sort of first round of refactoring of the code you did. I would definitely add it in there. So I wouldn't let it go too far. Because error trapping is one of those things that people always say they're going to go back and do, but they never do. All right, so that's something that, you know, maybe not your zeroth pass. But definitely your first pass through that you want to make sure that um, you put that in. Other questions? All right. Thursday, again, will be an all work day. So we'll meet upstairs in the lab. No. No reading days. I will post an announcement possibly today or possibly tomorrow about the final exam, but the final exam will be online. But the final exam will just be like a big quiz, in other words. And you see, 